This is water. Water is wet. Or is it? Of course it is. It's water. It has to be wet. Or does it? People on both sides of this issue think that their opinion is clearly correct, and carelessly hand wave away their opposition without truly considering the options. But what if I told you that the very idea of wetness is a mystery that goes far deeper than you might think? So, is water really wet? To examine this question, we'll have to consider a number of thought experiments. So let's get into it. Wet ass water, wet ass water. Bring a bucket and a mop for this wet ass water. Give me everything you got for this wet ass water. Without going over anyone's head with a high level of scientific detail, someone from the pro wet camp might propose the following postulates. Number one, the definition of wetness is to be in contact with water. Specifically, when water touches a thing, it takes it from a state of dryness to a state of wetness. Number two, then we naturally might assume that since water imparts the quality of wetness onto other things, it must itself be wet. These two arguments are the surface level explanations of most pro-wet perspectives, in a form that most people should be able to understand and they will serve as our starting point as we proceed. However, it might not necessarily be so simple, and there's some interesting philosophy that illustrates why. So let's take a slight detour and see where we wind up. Imagine a heap of sand. Suppose there are 15 million grains of sand in this heap and we decide to remove one grain. Now we have 14,999,999 grains of sand. Is this still a heap of sand? Certainly if we had one grain of sand, we would not have a heap. What about two grains? Three? You would be hardly aware that the sand is even there, let alone a heap. How many grains must we have for this to constitute a heap of sand? This is called Sorites' Paradox. Sorites' Paradox prompts us to question what it means to be a heap. Heapness is not a property inherent to the sand itself. Rather, it is a thing that emerges from the sand when we have a large amount of it. This is the principle of emergence. Emergent properties are qualities of objects that only exist under certain conditions. Similarly, we might argue that a towel that has been hit with a single molecule of water may not constitute a wet towel, even though it technically has made contact with water. If the presence of a single molecule of water would not make us say that our towel is wet, then it would not follow that a single molecule of water can be said to be wet. This isn't a huge problem for the pro-wet argument, they can simply revise their definition of wetness to say that the wetness of a thing is a property that emerges from there being the presence of a collection of water molecules in contact with an object. But this introduces a different problem, the many molecules paradox. It might follow that if we took a collection of water molecules, we would find that some of them are in contact with a collection of water molecules, particularly in the center. But on the edges of our water, we might find water molecules that are in contact with one or less molecules of water. If all that mattered were the presence of contact with the collection of water molecules, then some of our water would be wet and some of our water would not be. When asked, is water wet, we would end up with the conclusion, sometimes, rather than yes. 
This completely disestablishes the strength of the first pro-wet postulate, the necessity of a collection of water, not just any amount of water. Not only did we force a revision, but the revision that we forced leads us to a different conclusion. Now, imagine we were to spray a towel with bursts of water that were effectively pairs of water molecules, allowing each pair of molecules to make contact with the towel over time. Eventually, enough water would collect on the towel that it would be hard to argue that the towel was not wet. Yet, at no point before collecting on the towel was the water that we sprayed in contact with a collection of molecules of water. The many molecules paradox points out that the property of wetness is still just as subjective as the question of whether or not water is wet, putting us right back where we started. Even if we feel like water is wet, we're left with no means of establishing that water is in fact wet. Unless we can come up with revised postulates that could avoid these problems. So let's do that. What if we scrapped our first two postulates, and replaced them with a new postulate? Wetness emerges only when we have specific arrangements of molecules that include water molecules. The problem with this perspective is that these specific arrangements are entirely arbitrary. A person who is pro-wet could say that a collection of water molecules in a stream of water, the nectar of a fruit, and even a single water molecule could be considered a specific arrangement that is wet. But an anti-wet proponent could equally say that we could say that a single water molecule, etc. does not count as the specific arrangements of molecules that compose wetness. The argument is still completely unsolved. The ambiguity of our nebulous concept of wetness is no closer to being clarified. So, do we even know what it means to be wet? Does wetness even exist? We can create a third perspective corresponding to this question. Perhaps wetness doesn't exist at all. Maybe it's a made-up concept. The term Loki's Paradox, also known as Loki's Wager, originates from a fictional tale involving Loki, the Norse god. According to the story, Loki gets into a dispute with another god over a wager. The wager involves Loki's head, meaning that if Loki loses, the other god is entitled to take Loki's head as payment. Loki loses the wager, but when the other god comes to claim Loki's head, Loki objects. He argues that while the god is entitled to his head, the god is not entitled to any part of his neck, lest he suffer Odin's wrath. Since the exact boundary between the head and the neck is not clear, Loki claims that the god cannot take his head without also taking part of his neck, which wasn't part of the wager. The gods argue back and forth until eventually Loki is spared his punishment because of the ambiguity of where the head ends and the neck begins. However, just because we cannot say precisely where the head ends and the neck begins does not mean that we can't say that there is not such a thing as a head and such a thing as a neck. Similarly, just because we don't know precisely what makes something wet or dry does not mean that there isn't such a thing as wet or dry. Thus, we can reject our third perspective. Although we know it exists, the mystery of wetness is not so easily resolved. There is a great depth of philosophical ideas that could inform our perspective, but they cannot tell us with certainty whether or not water is actually wet. That is something that everyone must decide for themselves. So what do you think? I want to know your thoughts. Is water wet? How would you define wetness? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.
Fortunately, I know a doctor who is my wife. These women are describing a serious gynecological condition. 